Hello and many thanks for joining us on the program People, Politics and Power. I am Imonia Marere. The issue of resource allocation has been a very controversial and touchy subject in Nigeria's political history. The situation is such that much more attention is paid to the sharing of the national cake than to its baking. This has resulted in agitations for resource control and power devolution with these attendant resource devolution to the federating units. Nigeria's revenue has since the military era in the mid-60s been centrally collected and distributed to the various tiers of government by the federal government itself, which put in place an allocation formula decided by it. The last time an allocation formula was put in place, which subsists till now, was in 1992, almost 30 years ago. And it has been the subject of so much hue and cry, particularly by those who insist that it leaves too much of the nation's wealth in the hands of the federal government, to the disadvantage and detriment of the states and local governments, which of course are the main centers of development, especially in a democratic setting. The current formula vests 48.50% of all monies from the Consolidated Revenue Fund of the Federation in the federal government. The 36 states get 26.72% while the 774 local governments get 20.6% of the funds. Although the 1999 Constitution, as amended, prescribes in Section 32, Subsection B, Part 1 of the Third Schedule, that the review of the formula be carried out from time to time, it has taken the Revenue Mobilization, Allocation and Fiscal Commission 30 long years to carry out this review and recommend a new sharing formula, which is submitted to President Muhammadu Buhari last week Thursday. The proposed formula, which some analysts say is a mere cosmetic surgery, reduces the federal government's allocation by 3.33% to 45.17%. On the other hand, it increases the allocation to states by 3.07% to 29.79% and 0.44% for local governments to bring it, their allocation to 21.04%. The Commission also recommended an increase of 0.2% for the Federal Capital Territory, FCT, to bring its allocation to 1.2% and a decrease of 0.38% uh, for the development of natural resources to make its allocation 1.3%. It also recommended that 1% of the revenue be allowed for ecology and 0.5% for stabilization fund. The proposal must, however, be presented to the National Assembly in the form of a bill for passage into law before it can be operationalized. Given that Nigeria has undergone significant socio-economic, political, and structural changes in the last 30 years since the last revenue allocation formula was adopted, does the new proposal meets the expectations and the needs of current realities in Nigeria. Should the federal government continue to carry some of the responsibilities and resources it, present, it is presently hanging on to? Does it make for equity, fairness, and justice in a federal system of government? Join our conversation as we interact with a panel of experts comprising an economist, 
a political and a political economist uh, as we look at these issues. But first, let's take some sound bites from the submission of the proposed formula to the president last Thursday. Sir, as you may be aware, Section 32B, Part 1 of the Third Schedule of the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has amended, empowers the Commission to review from time to time the revenue allocation formula and principle in operation to ensure conformity with changing realities, provided that any revenue formula which has been accepted by an act of the National Assembly shall remain in force for a period of not less than five years from the date of commencement of the act. Pursuant to the above constitutional provisions, therefore, the Commission reviewed the vertical revenue allocation formula last year, 2021. The consideration of the exercise was informed by the following factors. One, the last general review of the revenue allocation formula was done over 29 years ago, precisely 1992. Two, the political structure of the country has since changed with the creation of six additional states in 1996, which brought the number of states to 36. Correspondingly, the number of local government also increased from 589 to 774. Three, there have been considerable changes arising from policy reforms that alter the relative share of responsibilities of the various tiers of government, such as deregulation, privatization, and the lingering controversies over funding of primary education, primary health care, etc., etc. Four, inadequate to decay infrastructure and heightened widespread internal security challenges across the country. Five, ecological challenges like global warming, desertification, flooding, and population explosion. And six, inability of the vertical formula to adequately address the apparent mismatch between statutory assigned functions and tax powers of each of the three tiers of government. I am aware that the present revenue allocation formula has not been reviewed since the last exercise carried out in 1992. Considering the changing dynamics of our political economy, such as privatization, deregulation, funding arrangement of primary education, primary health care, and growing clamor for decentralization among others, it is necessary that we take another look at our revenue sharing formula, especially the vertical aspect that relates to the tiers of government. All right, here you have it, the chairman of the Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Commission and, of course, President Muhammad Buhari, who received the report of the commission. And the president says that the implementation of the new proposal, we have to wait at least for the um, constitutional review process that is ongoing. But we'll return in a moment after the short break and we'll meet our guests. All right, let's get to meet our guest who is with us right now. He's joining us virtually from uh, the commercial city of Lagos, Mr. Sam Chidoka. Mr. Chidoka is the MD, that's Managing Director of Kairos Capital Limited. He is an economist. Mr. Chidoka, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, sir. Happy to be here. Great. Now, we also expect to join us uh, in the studio in a short while, Mr. Adakole Jogi, who is a political economist. But let's begin with you, Mr. Sam Chidoka. Um, the proposed new uh, revenue, mobile, uh, revenue allocation formula uh, coming 30 years after the last review was done. Many are wondering, why did it take so long? Because even by the admission of the uh, chairman of the Mobili Revenue Mobilization Commission, 
it ought not to have taken that long. At least uh, a period of between 5 to 10 years uh, would have just been adequate for a review. Why has it taken so long, 30 years, for a review to be done? Well, I, I honestly don't know why it's taking so long, but I, and I agree that it shouldn't have taken so long for this to happen. Um, we need to be in tune with what's happening around us and what's happening within our economy. Um, we need to constantly review some of these things. So if you look at the basis for revenue sharing in the country, it should be something that should be reviewed from time to time and not after 30 years. Uh, I think 30 years has taken a long time for this to happen, but you know it has finally happened and we can start to review what has um, what this means for the economy and what it means for the nigerian state vis-a-vis -vis the local government the states and the federal government as a whole but just to answer your question directly 30 years is way too long it should have happened earlier than we have done it yeah we, we, we shall come to the impact this uh, proposed one would have on the economy and the politics of the nation generally. But let's look at the existing one uh, uh, first. Now, for 30 years, we have uh, adopted and implemented the existing revenue sharing formula. And like you and I know, it has been the subject of so much controversy, the subject of so much hue and cry. States and local governments who think that they are not getting enough from the federally allocated uh, revenue. And in fact, sections of the country that have also been calling for either resource control or devolution of powers with the attendant devolution of resources to match the responsibilities that will be given. And the fact that the exclusive legislative list of the 1999 constitution has amended contains about 68 items that are exclusively in the uh, uh, federal government's uh, purview. Now, how well has that served the needs of Nigerians these past 30 years? Well, if you look at it based on uh, the economic realities, especially where we are today as a nation, you can argue that this hasn't quite served us well. But I, I do not think that so if you look at, there's two ways to look at it. You can look at the broad economy and take the decision as to, or view as to how has this served us. And beyond the revenue sharing, there are other issues that has affected the broad economy. But now, just to focus on the sharing formula, you can argue that um, if we are really a federating country, if we are really practicing true federalism, then perhaps the, the states or the units of government that generate the revenue should be in charge of their revenue and just give a portion of it to the central and not the other way around as we practice. What we practice is not in its true sense um, the federalism that we've touted, but that's what our constitution says. So fundamentally, I think that we need to amend the constitution in a way that the federating units have more control over their resource. Now you can go ahead and answer and ask the question, even when we are done 13% revision for oil um, revenue, when uh, we've looked at uh, devolution of resource control, uh, how well has it affected the states that have benefited from it? Well, if you go on the streets of some of those states and ask, some will argue that they haven't quite gotten the full benefits of that. But I do say that, um, and I hear you and I do agree that the, the exclusive list is quite way too large. We need to gradually begin to remove some of the things that are on the exclusive list and find their way to the concurrent list. I can't understand why things like power, things like um, um, rail transport, water transport, even what we so-called federal roads exist in this country. You find a road that runs inside a state and, it's, and it is a federal road. And then the state uh, has to get permission from the federal government to fix the road within the control of the governor. I think that that's just bureaucratic bottlenecks that we need to fix in as we are amending the constitution we need to reduce the exclusive list and increase the concurrent list and allow full autonomy of the local governments because really they are the ones closest to the people now many people have described what we operate today as feeding bottle federalism uh, and they insist that if we continue along that path uh, we, we are not only uh, not uh, 
implementing or practicing true federalism, physical federalism as uh, it is called, we are in, in essence uh, overpowering the, uh, the central government to the detriment and to the disadvantage of the federating units. Now, does, does, the, does this new formula uh, de deviate from that part, from the feeding, feeding bottle federalism part that we have traded these past 30 years and even more? Well, it's, if one can argue that there's some form of deviation, but not material. It's a step in the right direction. It's the way to go. So what you have done is to reduce what goes to the federal government and increase what goes to the states and increase marginally what goes to the um, local governments. So federal governments are going to lose about 3.3% of the revenue accruable to them. The states will gain, the local governments will gain just somewhere around 0.4% of increase. Um, how material that is, um, it's neither here nor there. Uh, I, I don't think materiality in terms of the amount that will go to this um, federating unit uh, comes to bear. However, it's a step in the right direction. It's the way to go. Also, I saw the response of the federal government in, resp in response to what um, Ramfak has done to say that you need to go to the National Assembly and make sure that there's a concurrence between what is on the exclusive list and what's on the concurrent list uh, in terms of how revenue is shared. And I think that's also the step in the right direction. I'm hopeful that the federal government, um, the legislature, I mean, will do the necessary thing and ensure that this new sharing formula, which is a step in the right direction, comes to see the light of the day. And that we don't wait another 30 years to see further reviews. Um, it goes with all that is happening around us. Um, you can argue that power, it will be the engine for activation of the economy. If you look at us today, we're not a productive economy. That's part of the major challenge we have as a country. We're not productive enough. If we have 200 million people, our productivity is subpar. But for us to be productive, we need to have power. The smallest thing that you do, whether it's small and medium scale industry, even if you open a barber's shop, you need power to operate. How much more to when you talk about manufacturing, um, fast-moving uh, consumer goods manufacturing companies and all sorts of productive arms of the economy. You need power. Now, for power to work, the federal government has not been able to provide it over these years. Why don't we allow the state government to provide to work in that sense? So that's part of the ways to go, to activate the economy, to make the economy productive, to get more people involved in, in producing goods and services that will grow the gross domestic product of the, of the country. So... I would say that it's a step in the right direction. We've moved the needle, but we haven't moved it far enough. Mr. Chidoka, maybe we should take a step backwards a, a, a bit and, and look at uh, the whole process of revenue sharing, uh, the emphasis that is placed on sharing the revenue uh, as against emphasis on baking the cake, on producing the revenue itself. Uh, over the years, since independence, all we have done is share, share, and share. Uh, not much emphasis is placed on what is produced or how the cake is baked, from who, who bakes it, where it is baked from, and what ingredients are applied in the baking of this cake. Uh, and the, this proposed new formula is along that same path. It's along that same process. Nobody is talking about baking the cake. Nobody is talking about producing the revenue. All we are more interested in is who gets what, when and how from this cake. Well, I, I think that it, there are two sides of, of the equation, right? So there's a conversation around how you share. And if um, you take the chairman of Ramfac into consideration. His job is to determine, or the committee, commission, their job is to determine sharing. So they are doing their job. That's what they are limited to. There is the other side of it, which is talking about how we grow what you share. That's beyond the, that commission. Um, that's a more um, federal conversation. It's a more macro conversation. A conversation of how we grow the economy, a conversation of how we grow our revenue, 
Um, so if you look at our GDP, our GDP today, uh, still the services industry produces the highest part of our GDP. Oil and gas is still less than 8% of GDP. Agriculture also does well for our GDP. But if you look at revenue, oil and gas is perhaps more than 80% of our foreign currency revenue as a nation. Now, that's not sustainable. So you've got to diversify the revenue. Uh, sometimes I hear people talk about diversifying the economy. And I do argue that if you don't know the problem, you can't fix it. It's not so much as per diversifying the economy as measured by GDP, diversity in GDP. We already have it somewhat. What we need to diversify is revenue. The revenue that comes from the federal to the federal government today oil and gas provides a huge chunk of that revenue and that has got to change so we've got to make more from taxation we've just got to increase the tax net by making more from taxation i'm not advocating for increase in taxes itself i'm advocating for increase in the tax net bringing more people into the tax net you've got to increase what we get from other parts of the economy and that's by making the economy productive and as I've mentioned earlier on, one of the ways to make the economy productive is that we have to have, we have to have power. We have to have a trained uh, manpower that is able to produce. Uh, you, it's, it begs the question today to think that if you look at the construction industry, many of the people that do high-end construction actually hire foreigners as handy workmen. So laborers, uh, plumbers, um, tilers. They prefer to get people from our neighboring country and even people from offshore to come and do the work why we don't have skilled labor so when we talk about education it's not just about the four walls of the university we need to teach vocation and skilled labor all these things have a way of coming around to contribute to the growth of the economy to the growth of the revenue and to the growth of what is shared so you can we can talk all day around how we share the cake if the cake is small it is small to grow the cake, we need to have a wider conversation, a conversation that includes those that manage the physical part of our economy, those that manage the monetary side of our economy, coming together to look at how we make the economy more productive and how we can get more revenue as the federal government, state government, and local governments. All right, Mr. Chidoka, stay with us. Uh, we have now been joined by Mr. Dakole Jogi, who is a political economist, and I'll be... Uh, pushing him to tell us the relationship between uh, the economic health of the nation and its politics. Mr. Jogi, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Thank you. Right, so we have been uh, having a conversation around the new, the proposed revenue allocation formula that's just been submitted. Submitted last week by the Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Commission. Uh, uh, of course, the, pro the new allocation is, uh, some have said, is a marginal adjustment to the old or to the existing one, which was put in place and adopted 30 long years ago. It has taken 30 years for us to have a recommended new revenue uh, formula. And before you came in, I had asked Mr. Chidoka whether the 30 years that it has taken the commission to come up with this new proposal uh, is justified by what it has now put forward. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Imoni, for, 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 for that question and thank you for, uh, for having me. Well, let me start by saying that um, um, when you look at the structure of the Nigerian economy, you know, vis-a-vis -vis its um, um, revenue or income generating you know, devices, you will see that, that for some of us, we have argued, you know, we have maintained and the, the position that when it comes to revenue allocation and, uh, and revenue distribution, that the government is a little bit, you know, over concentrating on issues that are not actually the real issues. They are concentrating on the symptoms and not the, the, the disease itself as it were. Because when you look at the minor adjustments done, it's just uh, taking a few percentages here, two or three percentage from, from the states and the local government, adding to the federal government, that kind of stuff. But you know that the problem, the issues that we have, the revenue challenge that we have, goes beyond the sharing formula. 
One, I would like to, I, I heard my, uh, my, my, my colleague, uh, Mr. Chidoka. Uh, Mr. Chidoka, earlier I was saying some, some, some very pertinent things, and I, I tend to agree with him, that first and foremost, one, you can tinker and tweak the revenue sharing formula for all you can. It's still not answering the problem, the issues that we have. Just like I have stated that, it's going after the symptoms and not the disease itself. Because if you look at the structure of the Nigerian budget, you will find out that we have a revenue pro problem. A revenue challenge, a revenue issues. These issues is why our budget is always in deficit, why we spend close to 1.6, between 1.6 and 2 trillion naira servicing debts. We spend, we borrow about 40% of our, 40% of our, uh, 40 of our, our, our budget, uh, so we have to source from outside. So you see that you can tinker with the sharing formula, but you're still not facing the problem. And I agree with him. You need to get the Nigerian economy to be productive. You need to expand the tax, uh, the tax base. You need to bring in other items like I'm for property tax, I'm for vehicle tax, things taxes that Hitato are not. I mean, I don't understand why uh, Oga Imuni should have three cars. You can have one, then the two others should be paid for. Oga Imuni has three houses: one in Banana Island, one in Asokoro Extension, and the other one in Kaduna. I wish no, you I should have. <laughs> what, I, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that we should introduce a, a better taxation uh, 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 policy or a better taxation mix, so as to grow the revenue. We should look at issues, uh, uh, things like like why are we uh, hovering around 1.5 to 2 million barrels per day? Are you aware that, that Saudi Arabia, with a population of less than 50 million people, produces over 10 million barrels per day? Why are we still hovering around 1.6 to 10 million to, to 2 million barrels per day? We need to increase the revenues that we, the income streams for government before we talk about how we share it because it is, it is, it is, it is poor. It is, if you take, if, if you look at it, I, I haven't done that of uh, uh, 2022. Revenue as a percentage of GDP. That of last year, revenue of, as a percentage of G GDP in Nigeria is less than 4%. Revenue, government revenues, as a percentage of our GDP that is almost 500 billion US dollar e e economy. What we're saying in essence, even when you do revenue as a percentage of budget and you compare it to other countries, similar you know, uh, 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 countries, uh, peer review countries, you find out that Nigeria, you, what we're doing actually is like winking in the dark. So but to answer your question directly, I would say, look, you can tinker with the revenue sharing f formula. That's like winking in the dark. It's like, like I said, it's the symptoms you are following and not the, disease, not the disease itself. What the government needs to do at this moment is to provide a clear out strategy on how to increase the revenue the income stream for government so as to fund the budget without going into deficit, so as to fund infrastructure. He, he spoke about um, uh, um, road infrastructure. I would like to add, uh, add other, other social infrastructures that you need that, that, uh, that will produce or enable the economy to function. Because if the economy is not functioning, you cannot tax the economy. You can't tax a dying economy. So you see, it is, it is a, it's a complete mix of, of policies that government needs to carefully design. And this idea of, of a break and quench or that this nation is Nigerian, Nigeria is going to evaporate in, in one day, I, I think we should stop all this fire brigade approach and put a, a clear 10-year plan to say we need to grow the Nigerian economy for at least 12% for the next consecutive 32 quarters. 32 quarters, that's about eight years so as to show up a few things. Not the way this, uh, this administration is running the, the economy that the, the average since 2015 has been 1.5. These are not adulterous figures. These are figures that 1.5, the, the Nigerian economy since 2015 has not grown beyond, is an average from 2015 to now of 1.5%. What we're saying that for us to engender any form of development, to put the economy path in the, on the path of growth, to enable the, the government tax businesses around and generate revenue to fund infrastructure to maintain government we need to grow the economy for at least 12 percent minus uh, 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 what do you call it uh, 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 population growth and inflation you need to keep inflation certainly less than 10 percent single digits i'm in a region of five to six percent because that's another issue that I've been trying to bring to the bear when we, when we discuss Nigerian economy and all that. I bring to bear the issue of the value of the currency. Look, Ogaimoni, you can fix 
insecurity. You can fix education. You can fix infrastructure. You can fix healthcare. If you do not pay critical attention to the value of your currency, what you are doing is going around in circles. Because the value of the currency determines the, 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 the value of the goods and services that you get. Because as the economy, I tell you, like between 2015 and now, the Naira has, ha, has lost over 500% over of its value. The Naira. So if you fix all this thing and the Naira keeps losing its value, this fuel crisis and all these small, small crises that we're facing is because of the value of the currency. This commodity is dealt in the US dollars and you make provisions for it. They call it, uh, they are trying to be clever by half. They call it under recovery. But it's the same thing. It is a, uh, what do you call it, subsidy. Now, that subsidy is denominated in our budget in Naira. And then the economy, the, the, the exchange rate is not stable. It's, it keeps moving from here to there. So that's why you ha keep having that huge dif uh, difference, differential. That's why the government keeps presenting supplementary budgeting. That's why we're saying that when we pay critical attention to the value of the currency, a sachet of pure water in 2015 that was 5 Naira, now it is 3 for 50 Naira. A mudu or a, a, a kilo of, 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 of what do you call it, beef here in Abuja in 2015 was 1,200 Naira. Now it is 2,800 Naira. Because we do not pay critical attention to the value of the currency. When you do, you do not increase the sufferings of the people. We will not be bothered about revenue sharing. Sharing what? There is nothing to share. It is, it is, it is infinitesimal. It is, it, is, it is poultry. It is small. Because the government is borrowing to even fund budget, run the government and pay salaries. So what we are saying in essence is to face, let's get down to the fundamentals of the Nigerian economy. Which are Let's get back to productive ways. Let's get back to stability in, macro, macro, in macroeconomic stability, in our fiscal policy and in our monetary policy. Those managing, I know that you cannot throw money to all the problems. So you need the fiscal side of it. So as to design the appropriate policy that will be matched by the monetary policy to drive the process of growth and development. You need to focus on small, medium and scale businesses. You need to provide a, a capital for startups and scale ups. You need to ensure that the policy, no policy somersault. When we keep a policy, if you say that there are BDCs can, can access Forex or next tomorrow it is only banks that can access it, we need some level of stability, especially when you look at how dollarized our economy is. I think that we need to do certain things right. And Ogai Moni, I'm talking about a 10-year plan, not this midterm, mid, uh, mid, mid, this MTEF, the midterm expenditure framework that they submit every two, two years. It is too short term. It is too, too short term. I understand the pressures from the World Bank and the IMF. But hey, we are talking about the Nigerian people, our welfare, our development. We should tell the World Bank and the IMF the basic truth. We need to grow our economy from within. And if we, do, we need to do that, if we're going to do that, we need a 10-year plan. We don't need a two, three-year plan, no. We need a 10-year plan that is unchangeable, that is fixed, so that any government that is coming in, we can fix. They'll just key into that project. Like I can tell you a few things that this government is doing right. That this infrastructure, something headed by the vice president that is long-term, that they are sourcing from, uh, from um, they, they, they don't source from the expensive uh, capital markets that are uh, from bonds and things like, like, we, like we usually do. They go for concessionary loans that are long term and are below two or three percent uh, interest rate. So we're, we're talking, we're saying that we need to plan better. Then when we have the revenue, we can now share it. But right now, Simply, there's no revenue. There's no income to be shared. Nothing to share. Nothing to share. All right, Mr. Chidoka, let, let me bring you in uh, at this point in time. Now, if you look at the existing revenue allocation formula uh, of 48.5 for the federal government, 26.72 for the states, the 36 states, and 20.6% uh, for the uh, 704 local governments. How well has this impacted the developmental needs of the country from the local government up to the federal level? Well, so um, it's, uh, <laughs> I think that you need to look at what we've seen in recent past and what we've seen over time. If I start with the local governments, with the local governments, local governments has they've gone, we've given them a sort of a pass. Most people have given the local government a pass. We haven't quite felt the impact of local government. Most places, most times when you hear conversations in our economy, we're talking about the federal government 
is about 70% of the conversation. The state government is perhaps about 29% of the conversation. And the local government gets maybe about 1% or 0.5% of the conversation. Because, again, you find that what has happened over time is that the local government does not even get the allocation. When you have a joint account with the states, when money goes into the states, into the joint account, the states decide what happens. And the local government um, is just an apparatus of government that is written on paper and does not fight the law. However, we need to reverse this. Local government is the unit of government closest to the people, and people should feel the local government, the pulse of the people. That's where the local government should be. But even if you look at in our politics and the way we are, we uh, we vote in people, not many people care about local government elections. Uh, you go to many states and you hear local government election and you don't know that anything is happening because we really don't care about that strata of government. But we should begin to care about that strata of government. And once we start to make sure that they get full autonomy, then we must also face the local government chairman, the councillors, and make sure they're doing what is right. At the state level, uh, we haven't seen so much from some states. Some states have done the right things. And you see, there are some states in Nigeria that, you know, as a financial analyst, you want to analyze their, their budgets, their numbers, but we haven't seen budgets published in two years, three years. So you don't even know how the states are performing. Some states, you go to their websites, their budgets are up to, up to, up to speed. Uh, you can get information regarding the states. You don't need to um, trigger the Freedom of Information Bill to get information about some of the states. So some states are performing well in terms of providing infrastructure, in terms of providing information. Then you come to the federal government, the truth of the matter, like my brother and studio also said, we're just not productive enough. There isn't enough money. I think one of the uh, ideas say that Nigeria is not a rich country. I know some people, uh, this is controversial, and some people will quarrel that we have a lot of money, but what is happening is that we are not um, allocating it properly and spending it properly, and there's a lot of corruption. But look at the numbers. We are spending over 90% of our revenue servicing debt. Look at the numbers. The total income from our oil and gas that provides 80, over 80% 80 of our FX revenue, in fact, over 90% of FX revenue, is not up to the recurrent expenditure of the country. If you take all the money we make as a country and you, none of it is stolen, there is no corruption, and you share it to all Nigerians who will all still be broke. So we're just not productive enough. We're not making enough money as a nation. And we need to diversify our revenue ability as a country. We need to increase it and become productive. And again, I'd say that you don't enforce production when you have not provided the factors of production. So you can ban import of certain goods and services. If we don't have the capacity, if we don't have the resources, if we don't have the manpower, if you don't have the power that is required, if you don't have capital formation to produce those things locally, no matter how long you ban, it will not work. So I'll give you an example. You're doing business in Nigeria. You want to take a bank loan. You take a bank loan, they'll ask you to bring um, collateral. You have to look for collateral to provide for the bank loan. You take the bank loan at over 20%, sometimes 24%. If you go to the micro lenders, sometimes 36%. Sometimes 60% per annum for the micro lenders. When you borrow money as a small business at 48% or 24% or 36%, how much are you going to make to repay the loan and be productive? It's just money that you have borrowed that is most likely going to be failed business. So there is this issue around capital formation, being able to get capital. You're competing with a man who is in China who is borrowing money at 2%, 3% and sometimes even get interest-free loan from their government. How do you compete? The man has power. The man has skilled labor. They have vocational studies. People have been taught how to be productive. We don't have those factors of production. We can't compete. So I think that structurally, there's something wrong with our economy. We need to go back and restructure the economy, make Nigeria more productive, and begin to get revenue, not just from um, oil and gas alone, but from other sectors of the economy, from taxation, and even from sports, from leisure. I ask the question, why can't Nigeria become a hub for air travel in Africa? We can do it. We have the resources. We have the power. We have the people. Um, we can create, but we just haven't done it. There's so much that we need to do to get revenue. Dubai today 
is making so much from just tourism. We can, but you can't do that if you don't have security. So um, it's a question of sometimes the chicken and egg in Nigeria, which one comes first? I think that what comes first is that we need to solve the issues around productivity being productive, solve the issues around insecurity in the country, look at how we train our manpower, look at how we even allocate the scarce resources that we have. The little that we have, what are we using it for? I think our recurrent expenditure is way too high. Um, and so on, on the fiscal side, we need to deal with it. You can't solve all economic problems with monetary policies. I see a lot of um, monetary policy movement, but I don't see a lot on the fiscal side. So if you ask how far we have done with what we have, I would say not so good. There's a huge room for improvement. Hmm. All right. M Mr. Adakole, uh, you, 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 you notice that uh, the chairman of the Revenue Mobilization Fiscal Commission, when he was presenting his report, did say that he had a wide range of consultations across the country. He visited all the states, as many local governments as possible. And so this may actually be an aggregate of the views that were expressed there. What do you think will be, in the days ahead, will be the reaction of critical sectors of the Nigerian state to this proposed formula of 45.1% uh, for federal government, 29.7% an increase now for states and 21% for the local government. Uh, it, it will, I mean, just marginal, of course, uh, used to be 20.6 for the local government, the government. and now 21.4. The, 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 where, as uh, Chiroka would uh, put it, marginal adjustments <laughs> to this revenue allocation. <laughs> but what, what are your expectations in terms of responses and reactions? Well, um, uh, moving forward, I agree with uh, my brother Chidoka that it's, um, it's just a marginal adjustment of uh, the revenue formula, the revenue sharing formula. And um, uh, moving ahead, I think that. Uh, uh, the critical stakeholders, that is the ones that are in government, that is, will start to, you know, react. Some will start to comment on their losses. Some will start, uh, the ones that w w want to seek more, wish that they had more, especially uh, in the ranks of, uh, of, of, of the governors who have been advocating for more revenues to be given to the governor. To the government, to the governors, or to states, to more states. likes, yes. to states. Mm. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear uh, some comments about that, you know. But what, uh, for the larger part of the of the of the Nigerian people, I, I think uh, the Nigerian people, the everyday people like myself, will care less. It's not because they are insensitive or they are not patriotic enough to bother about who is getting what or what the government sharing formula is. Is that uh, as an economist, I always look at the numbers. And when you look at the numbers, you find out that the total government revenue, not even revenue, and bring the annual budget of Nigeria, and you juxtapose that to the Nigerian economy, to the GDP, you find that this is about 7.2%. So you're, uh, the, Nigerians, the Nigerian people cannot even be bothered about the sharing formula. And even besides, it's a, 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 in a structure of, 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 a, of a, in a governance structure that the Nigerian people that lacks legitimacy, that the Nigerian people don't trust. People will be, be imagine that the, 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 the local government is a conduit pipe, the, the civil service that consumes the running cost of government that consumes uh, close to 70% of our annual budget is an exercise in futility and riddled with corruption, with, uh, with uh, misappropriation and malpractice. So Nigerians don't really bother about such things. That is to answer you very succinctly and honestly. Mm. Now, so <laughs> you think that whatever happens, uh, where it's only those who hold political offices now, uh, those who have been agitating for uh, an adjustment of the resource allocation, Yes, that would be more bothered about this. You will hear people come up with say the the, the, the Lagos, the River State uh, the, uh, tax uh, case that is in the as in yeah, course. That's the Supreme Court. Yeah, the Supreme Court. You know, others will start spring, springing up because when you talk about uh, you look at the the, the, the the revenue pool of government, you will find that the big, the single the, one of the big, biggest single items is the, the VAT 
the VAT is one of the, 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 the collection or the VAT component of it is one of the, the, the second largest, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. So, so what, what, what in your thinking would be the relationship between this new formula and the developmental agenda of the various states, local governments, and even of the federal government? Well, well not to not to how well how well has uh, the, these two variables these two variables interacted over time well i agree with my brother chidoka that says revenue to development revenue to development yeah. yes that's seven that the conversation with in, in about subnationals is drowned out by the over concentration on the conversation of the federal government meanwhile development actually happens in the states and in the local government federal government is federal government doesn't own land they only provide policy direction and they do uh, what you call it. Uh, they, 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 they monitor, not monitor, not they, they supervise agencies. But to, 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 to talk about the monetary policy, uh, the, the, the sharing formula vis a vis development, and you look at the state and local government, just like he also pointed out, to, there's no development, there's scarcely any form of development happening at the third tier of government, which is the local government. So whether you adjust it by 1.3% by or increase it by, by 2%, you see that because of the structure of the Niger the governance structure is faulty with this, uh, the, the state joint accounts that the state governors barely give or release any money for development. They just pay local government salary, pension, and teachers and stuff. And then the rest, they, they, they do as they please. So I don't think y you can ac actually see any development trend with regards to this increment or decrease or, or this increment or de de decrement or decrease that you have with this current new formula, I don't think it can be tied to development. And as I said anyways at the beginning of this program, that there is nothing to share. Yeah. All right, m Mr. Chidoka, <laughs> very quickly, let's look at the other aspects of this um, uh, allocation, which has to deal with uh, ecology, stabilization, and development of natural resources. Ecology is getting 1%. Uh, stabilization fund is getting 0.5%. Uh, and development of natural resources, 1.3%. What do all these mean? Well, so again, it's, um, it's good on paper. But what it translates to, um, to the man on the streets is a different conversation. So the ecological fund, for instance, I know that that fund ought to help to assist um, uh, things like erosion sites and all of that. I'm from Obosi in Anambra State, and I know that there we have huge erosion sites in my place, and I haven't quite seen the uh, response from the ecological fund. Right? So it, on paper, it's good to allocate more to the ecological fund, the question is, what is the material sum? What does it come to? So if you do just back up the envelope um, calculation, I think if I remember correctly, in January, the, the states and the federal government, for instance, shared about 500 billion naira or plus 500 plus 500 billion and a change. If you assume 3% of that, that's somewhere less than 20 billion. That's 3% of that. If you assume that every state gets equally, just make that assumption to make the math easy, every state will be getting less than 500 million naira extra. So that's what really that has happened. So the, quest, the point is not about the 1% or the 45% or the 48%. That's not the issue. The issue is the 540 billion that is being shared. Why is it not 1 trillion that is being shared? That's, that's what I think fundamentally from our conversation today it's clear that that's what the issue is that if you said it was three percent of one trillion that we're talking about that's more than three percent of 500 billion all right then you are talking about 30 billion instead of 16 billion right so whether the ecological fund gets one percent the question is one percent of what one percent of one of of ten uh is less than one percent of hundred so the point is, there are two angles to this for me. Number one, we need to grow our revenue. Number two, the one that is allocated, we need to spend our money in such a way that we are pushing to meet the, the, the promises that the politicians made to the people. 
We're pushing to solve the problems in the economy, in the society, in the local governments, in the states with what we spend. Okay. Today, I think that there is a lot of opacity with how uh, government expenses is done. Federal, state, local government, we just need to come clean and make it open. Open government, open NAS, open executive, open the state, open the local government for all to see. Thank you so much, Mr. Chiloka, Mr. Adakole, Jogi. Your, your, your closing uh, comments, yeah. Well, I think since we're having a conversation about revenue sharing and uh, 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 revenue, revenues in general, my, my closing comments will be that the Nigerian state should, should seriously consider ways it's going to grow its revenues. And that when we economists say that the Nigerian economy is diversified, I think that it we're speaking out of tune. The Nigerian economy is already diversified. What we need to do, what government needs to do, is to diversify its revenue base. We need okay. to ensure that government has multiple streams of income, income. so as to have fund, a lot more to share. Fund, okay, to share. <laughs> 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 All right, thank okay. you so much. Adakale Jogi is a political economist. And, of course, we were joined all the way from Lagos, virtually, by Sam Chidoka, who is the MD, Kairos Capital Limited. He is a trained economist. Thank you so much, Mr. Chidoka, for your time. And, uh, of course, uh, to you, our viewers out there, we want to thank you for investing your time with us on the program today. Please join us again when we come your way with a fresh edition of People, Politics, and Power. Of course, if you missed this edition, you can always watch again and again on our various social media handles. My name is Imoni Amarere. Bye for now.